thank you for coming to talk to us about climate change. Now, the press, politicians, civil society, they're all finally waking up with David Attenborough's latest series on Netflix and BBC, with Extinction Rebellion bringing London to a standstill, with children striking in major cities around the world. The science hasn't really changed and scientists have been talking about climate change for a long time. So what do you think has changed? Hmm. Well, the science hasn't changed. Um, we're obviously, we've got a greater understanding now than we did perhaps a decade or two decades yeah. ago. I think really what's changed is we're starting to see a change in public opinion. But in terms of the climate itself, we're now a degree warmer than we were in pre-industrial times. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is now approaching 415 parts per million. That means that we're breathing in air that has a higher concentration than of carbon dioxide that at any time throughout human history, prehistory and beyond. You have to go back at least three million years, if not much longer, to find equivalent levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We really are living in unprecedented times. And we're starting to see the impacts of that in terms of the impacts on extreme weather events around the world. We've seen last summer extreme heat wave in the UK. We've seen other uh, very extreme flooding events causing billions of pounds worth of damage in recent years in the UK. And around the world, we're also seeing in the impacts of climate change with, for example, in Mozambique, extreme flooding as a result of cyclone damage this, this last um, winter, where the, the damage that was caused by that cyclone was undoubtedly exacerbated by mm. climate change. You've personally been very vocal on the subject of climate change. What started you on this journey from a scientist at the British Antarctic Survey to becoming an advisor to the government and a voice for action? So I started off as a mathematician and I wanted to use that mathematics to help understand the world around us. And that was a time when climate change really wasn't a political issue. Then as I've been studying that more and more and actually seeing for, with my own eyes the changes that have been occurring particularly in the polar regions which have seen exceptionally large temperature changes in the Arctic and very strong changes in the Antarctic as well, it's become very clear to me the scale of the changes that are occurring and the global impacts of those changes. And I really felt, apart from anything else, it's my duty as a scientist mm -hmm. to convey that understanding, that insight to a wider audience, to warn people, if you like, of the, of the dangers that are very, very clear to the scientists studying them. What's the science telling us now? So I think the key messages from the science are around the scale and the urgency of the challenge. So if we look at um, current temperature rise of about one degree, if we extend just our current rate of warming, we're likely to exceed 1.5 degrees of warming compared to pre-industrial uh, times between about 2030 and 2050, so in the next few decades. If we move beyond that, then we are really at risk of seeing very severe impacts of climate change. So as you go from 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming, for example, we're likely to see something like two to three times more animal species, plant and animal species, at risk of severe habitat loss. We're likely to see, in terms of coral reefs, for example, mm -hmm already under severe threat from both warming oceans and from ocean acidification, which is another side effect of increased carbon dioxide emissions. They're already under severe threat. At 1.5 degrees, most coral reefs may be lost. At 2 degrees, they may be gone entirely. That's not just a threat to our world's great biodiversity, mm -hmm. but it also has significant economic impacts because they're a source of, um, a, 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 of great tourism and also a, a critical aspect of the fishing industry as well. So those are aspects on the, on the animal, plant and animal kingdom, on our natural world, but there's also direct impacts on human worlds as well. So for example, it's anti uh, estimated that between 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming, several hundred million additional people will be exposed to a combination of climate risks and the risks associated with poverty. So it's very clear that in terms of both human well-being and the natural world, we want to keep temperatures as, as low as possible, temperature rise as low as possible. So are scientists now all in agreement what the climate change impacts are likely to be? So scientists are in complete agreement that the climate is changing and that the causes of that change are almost entirely human activities through our generation of fossil fuel um, burning, creating 
greenhouse gas emissions and other land use changes also producing greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emissions. One of the areas where there's still uncertainty and we're really trying to um, understand better in terms of the science are, for example, what might happen to the ice sheets covering Greenland and West Antarctica. So turning to Antarctica, for example, the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is a vast ice sheet covering a huge area of Antarctica, we know is potentially unstable. And there are a number of key glaciers that are critical to its stability, the Thwaites Glacier and the Pine Island Glacier in particular. And there's some evidence that those glaciers may already be in irreversible retreat. That's because the oceans around Antarctica are warming up and that warm water is able to creep underneath the glaciers and melt them from below. So my colleagues from the British Antarctic Survey have just come back from Antarctica where they've been looking at the Thwaites Glacier to try and understand its potential um, changes into the future. And they've been very concerned by what they've, what they've seen. Um, they, they reported that um, the, the ice shelf front simply didn't look like a normal, well-structured ice shelf front. It looked very degraded. And the concern with this is that if that Antarctic ice sheet did collapse, it would eventually lead to some three metres of sea level rise. And three metres of sea level rise might not sound like a very large number, but if you turn to any of the large cities around the world, London, New York, San Francisco, any of the growing mega cities in Asia, or, or indeed many of those in Africa, they're all located in coastal regions. Three metres of sea level rise would completely decimate the infrastructure in those cities and would displace literally hundreds of millions of people. It would be a globally catastrophic event. What we don't know is how fast that would happen. There's some signs, as I described, that this is a process that may already be occurring, um, but over how long, whether it takes decades or centuries, we simply don't know and it clearly it's a critical thing to understand. Now, business can be a very powerful platform for change and for climate change, for that to happen, it needs to be not just a risk, but it needs to be considered as a strategic issue by boards. Now, for that, businesses don't just need to understand the impacts of climate change, but also need to have the right data. So why do you think the message is not landing with business? Mm. So I'm not sure that it's true that the message isn't landing with business. My impression is that business, especially probably over the last 18 to 24 months, have really started to understand that climate risks are very material risks to them today that need to be taken into account. What I think is true is that to date, much of the climate science has been focused around looking at global average temperature. And that's been a very useful single metric to describe the scale of climate change that's occurred to date and what might occur into the future that's been incredibly powerful in terms of framing international policy, for example. But when it comes to understanding business-related risks, no business is directly exposed to global average surface temperature. They're mostly exposed to extreme weather events that occur at a particular location. And what has perhaps been missing is uh, a source of information to allow an assessment of those types of risk. Now that is actually much more scientifically complex to produce than forecasts of global average surface temperature, but very much the forefront of research, climate science research at the moment, is directed to producing that information. So I think we are going to see coming into the coming months and years much more precise information that allows businesses to make a much more comprehensive assessment of their physical risks from climate change. Now, do you think there's enough of the, so what does this actually mean, sort of explanations out there for people and businesses? Um, so one question that I very frequently get asked is, you know, what, are, what is the future that we're trying to avoid and what is the, you know, what is a much more um, uh, optimistic future that we might want to be trying to achieve instead? What's at stake, essentially? And um, I think probably we could do more in terms of articulating that. Where I think in particular, um, there is a real need is to, is to properly articulate the optimistic vision about this. I mean, I'm a climate scientist and I spend a lot of my time telling you the awful stories about how the Antarctic ice sheet may collapse and the world's going to end in doom and gloom. And that's not a very inspiring message 
for people. Um, I think in, a much more inspiring message is to talk about um, how, and I think it's really true, um, if we respond to climate change on, you know, taking into account the scale and urgency of the response that's required, we can um, provide a healthier future where we have less air pollution, we have people who are healthy because they're eating healthier diets and living healthier lifestyles, all of which have a positive climate benefit as well. We can have, we can create jobs and um, through innovation and, 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 and creativity um, around responding and delivering a zero carbon future. There are many, many positives and exciting messages around the response to climate change. And I think that that's where much more effort needs to be put into articulating that exciting vision of the future. Okay. Now, I've heard scientists talk about tipping points and feedback mm -hmm. loops. Now, now, what are they and are, are these factored into the scientific um, reports and projections that we've seen, like the IPCC report? So, if we look at the Earth's history, there are numerous examples in the last 100,000 years where we know from records from ice cores, for example, that the Earth has undergone major swings in temperatures. So if we look at the Greenland ice cores, for example, they show that in at least the North Atlantic region, there have been occasions when the temperature has switched by 10 degrees Celsius in as little as a decade. So we know that the Earth system can undergo dramatic, rapid changes in climate. And there are a number of aspects of climate change, where, uh, of the Earth system, where we are concerned that increased warming would start to trigger those sort of events. So one example of that um, would be the permafrost in the Arctic, which is melting. And there are concerns that as that melts, it, it could start to release methane into the atmosphere. Methane is a much more strong greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and so it would have a dramatic warming effect, which would then generate more melting of the permafrost and you start to go into a vicious cycle. Right. And in fact, one of the great concerns at the moment is that if we look at global methane levels, they were levelling off in the early 2000s and they have been significantly increasing in recent years. And we don't fully understand the causes of that. We think it probably isn't significantly from the Arctic, but it may be from tropical wetlands in part, and that in itself could be a feedback effect from climate change. So we are potentially already seeing some of these feedback effects in place, and they are a very worrying aspect of the climate system. They're the aspects where you might have some essentially black swan event occurring that would cause a catastrophic collapse. So is there time for us to make a difference? What should we all be doing now? So one of the very clear simplifications in terms of the science is that um, if you want to not exceed a certain temperature increase with some reasonable chance, there's a certain amount of carbon dioxide that you can put into the atmosphere before you essentially blow the budget for not exceeding that temperature mm -hmm. threshold. Now, if we look at what that budget is for not exceeding 1.5 degrees of warming with a reasonable chance, then we find that we've already put more than 2,000 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the amount left that we've got in our budget is ar around about 400, 420 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. So much, much less than the amount we've already put into the atmosphere. If you then look at how much we're putting into the atmosphere each year, it's around about 40 billion tonnes. 40 billion tonnes, we've got 400 billion tonnes left. You can do the arithmetic, it means we have not much more than 10 years at our current rate of emissions before we blow that budget for 1.5 degrees. And that, I think, in pretty stark terms, tells you about the scale and the urgency of the challenge. Another way to look at it is that at the end of last year, at the end of 2018, the IPCC, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, put out a report specifically looking at 1.5 degrees of warming. And in that report, they looked at pathways of decarbonisation that were consistent with keeping temperatures below 1.5 degrees with a reasonable chance. Now, if you look at current um, increases in greenhouse gas emissions, they essentially look like this. They're steadily increasing. And in fact, actually, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the last um, year or so. The pathways for decarbonisation essentially have to completely reverse that trend 
effectively starting today, so that it goes like this yeah. instead. And uh, what that means is that we have to halve our emissions of greenhouse gases over the next decade. Um, so instead of 40 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, we get down to 20 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide by 2030, and then down to net zero by the middle of the century. That's a really dramatic change that needs to occur effectively today. If we are to overt you know, dramatic climate change into the future. So what I'm hearing is we haven't got much time. Business as usual doesn't exist as such anymore and we have to act now. We have to act now because decisions that are made today by us as individuals or us as businesses will impact our future generations. And I think that it's, you know, frankly beholden on all of us to step up and take responsibility for those decisions. <laughs>